Hello everyone and welcome to another lockdown interview. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Frederik Rodenberg of Uno X development team and one quarter of the Danish pursuit team. Frederik is one of the fastest Danes on the road and has a strong background in track cycling, winning a bronze medal in the team pursuit event at the Rio Olympics in 2016 when he was only 18 years old. He has since won multiple world championship medals and was part of the quartet that won the European Championships for Denmark in 2019 and famously and most recently the quartet that broke the world record twice in Berlin and won the world championships. With the Tokyo Olympics postponed, Frederick and his other teammates will have to refocus but with a youthful squad it seems like the sky is the limit for this team. Much to discuss in a very bright future for the Danes. So without further ado, here is the interview with Frederik Rodenberg. Hi Frederik, how are you and where are you right now? Hi, uh, I'm very good. I'm in uh, Copenhagen right now, uh, just in, uh, in our apartment. So yeah, how has the lockdown been affecting you? Not very much in the sense that I can still train uh, the way I used to train, of course, uh, except on the track. Otherwise, uh, it has been a, yeah, a lot of uh, road training and just the base miles, uh, basically. Uh, but obviously, I have not been able to race like uh, the rest of the world. What kind of... Uh, we had Julius, who's part of your team. Uh, what kind of training do you guys, do you focus a lot on the track or is it mainly off the track that you focus and in the gym and stuff like that? Obviously, uh, since we are also track riders, we, we do a lot of uh, track and, and strength training as, as well. But it's uh, it's different from a uh, rider to rider individually. But uh, our base is is the is the road and uh, we make sure to get a, a lot of uh, base miles in before we, we step on the track and, and, and do uh, our final preparations uh, in there a lot of this is turning around the road so obviously with the olympics oh no let's just talk about the main news you guys made headlines in berlin when you broke the world record not only once but twice and then took the gold how was that whole experience for you because it was absolutely incredible for anyone from denmark yeah it was uh, it was pretty amazing uh we knew that uh, we we came in, in in good shape and uh, we had prepared well, but uh, to break break the world world record like we did, uh, especially in the qualifying, uh, that was uh, yeah we didn't expect it uh, to be uh, that much. But I guess uh, homework uh, when you do that uh, really good, it, it helps and uh, and it clearly shows at Worlds that uh, we have done our homework uh, pretty good. So since it's such a short time, do you all have roles within the team at certain points in the ride that uh, either you or Julius or Niklas or Les, uh, you take like the first 100 meters and then you swap or? Yeah, we, we know beforehand exactly uh, what's going to happen and, and when it's going to happen. Uh, so the two most obvious uh, yeah, roles within the team is, is Rasmus, who, who is our starter and uh, who swings off after around uh, 10 laps. Uh, also, um, so uh, he's uh, responsible for the first, uh, yeah, 750 meters, and uh, then you can say that my job is cleaning up after all the others and uh, and bringing us home. So if something doesn't go to plan, uh, someone uh, is fading uh, within the, one of their turns, uh, it's my job to kind of uh, shout them out and uh, and then uh, cl clean up uh, after them and uh, and bring us home. So uh, it depends uh, if I take uh, three and a half laps, four laps or four and a half laps uh, in, in my last turn. Uh, but um, it, it is uh, regulated beforehand. So does where you are within the roles, does that how, is that how your training kind of differs? Um, yeah, a bit. Uh, obviously, uh, Rasmus said is a lot more anaerobic than the rest of us. He's also quite a big guy, so he spends a lot of time at the gym. Um, uh, where, uh, yeah, speaking uh, for myself, uh, I don't spend uh, quite a lot of time, uh, or as much time in the gym as, as he does, uh, since I have, uh, yeah, uh, you can say that I'm gifted naturally, that I don't really need uh, a lot more speed and a lot more strength uh, to be able to take uh, team pursuit turns. Uh, so uh, I focus a lot of, on, on improving my endurance uh, so I can uh, rest the better when I'm uh, in the wheel. Are you more inclined to being a sprinter? Because uh, I've heard on Velropa's podcast 
that uh, you can do 1400 watts for quite a bit of time. Uh, yeah, I, I am a sprinter uh, on the road. Um, but when you ride the track uh, and you call yourself a sprinter, it, it, it doesn't really seem like anything because the guys in there are so big and, and they are so powerful. Uh, but on the road, uh, I am a sprinter and and I does well in, in races, uh, which is uh, not too not too hilly, uh, but uh, with a with a fast finish. How do you kind of refocus now with the Olympics getting getting delayed for a year? You're all really young, so a year shouldn't only really make you faster, which is scary news for anyone else. Yeah, um, obviously it's a big hit that uh, we can't do the Olympics this year. But uh, on, yeah, like you say, on the other hand, we are really young, all of us. Uh, so uh, we pretty yeah quickly realized that uh, this is not going to be uh, a disadvantage for, for us, uh, but uh, maybe just an advantage, uh, actually, um, uh, because we can uh, evolve so much more physically, all of us. And then uh, we have a lot uh, going on in the background, equipment wise and, and testing and a lot of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, it's obviously not, not fun to <laughs> wait one more year, but uh, I hope it's going to be worth the wait. This would have been your second Olympics. You actually did your first Olympics back in Rio when you were only 18. What was it like as an 18, a junior going to the Olympics and then suddenly you're winning a bronze medal for Denmark? That was a, a crazy experience. Uh, I got sort of thrown into the project pretty late uh, with uh, Niklas. So uh, it wasn't anything that I was targeting like uh, two years out or anything like that. It was more... Yeah, six months out, I was like, oh, I can maybe go to the Olympics. And then it all just went so uh, so fast. And uh, yeah, uh, it was pretty special to be there when you're so, so young um, and especially winning a medal. It was, it was uh, really incredible. But uh, yeah, I, in some ways, I think I was maybe too young to really enjoy it and, and get the full, full experience in some ways. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to, to Tokyo. Were you able to take in any of the, like, see the other events or was it just focused on the team pursuit and then that was it? Or did you get to experience other events? Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, I saw all the events. After my competition, I saw all the rest of the events uh, uh, in the track. And then we had a, a little vacation in, in Rio afterwards uh, where we could uh, go around and, uh, and watch some of the other sports competing. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, it was a crazy experience. Uh, to say the least, uh, <laughs> it's something that I, I want to try again. You've done kind of um, a lot of World Cups. You even, that have taken you all over the world. You even went to Colombia in Cali. What was that experience like to be in South America? Yeah, I've actually been in Cali twice uh, now. Uh, and yeah, it was one of my favorite place, places to be. It's such a different culture than in Europe and uh, and in Asia, uh, but the, yeah, especially the people and uh, the fans uh, within the track are, are really, uh, yeah, they, they're really loud and, and you can just feel their passion for, for cycling, even though it, it's track cycling, which is not as big as, as road, obviously. It's just fun that you can experience uh, some of uh, these places uh, around the world uh, doing, uh, yeah, kind of your hobby and, uh, and now you as your job. Denmark, the Team Pursuit squad has always been like something that we've done well in and it's quite nice to see that you kind of followed it through from being behind the Australians and Brits and now overtaking them and setting the benchmark for everyone. So how has it kind of been for you to, because you finished third and second as well in the World Championship, so yeah. you have all the medals, so that must be really nice for you to have kind of gone that way and <laughs> <Yeah>. set down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, yeah, it's, it's been nice to take the step up. Uh, because uh, yeah, especially the Australians and and uh, Great Britain have all, always been these two uh, big nations that that has been uh, quite uh, difficult to touch, uh, and they also seemed like they were so far in front of uh, the rest of the pack. Uh, but now seeing that they are human humans too, and uh, yeah, they're not better than us at all. Um, that uh, yeah just gives us a lot of motivation and. Uh, and we really have a lot of belief in ourselves uh, now, especially after Berlin. Uh, but at the same time, we know that nothing is uh, is given at all. Um, and we know that we have to be a lot faster than we were in Berlin uh, to to take uh, the Golden Tokyo. And that is, uh, that is also the goal. Yeah, Steve Cummings, uh, who's a former pro, uh, he was actually on here as well. And he was he said he was absolutely amazed. And he's won 
a world championship himself. So, uh, yeah, he he said he fell in love with track cycling again, watching you guys. But like, how low do you think the world record can perceivably go? I think a lot of it uh, depends on the, U- the UCI and uh, which uh, regulations they are gonna take in the future. So obviously, if if you have a if it's gonna be legal to uh, make a bike where you can uh, live that down, it's gonna be easy on the 330. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, if we say with the reg- regulations we have now, uh, I guess we're gonna go sub 340. Uh, I think here within the, the next couple of years, um, especially if the if the track in, in Tokyo is as fast as uh, some people say. So yeah. I think it's gonna be there's gonna be some pretty crazy times in Tokyo. Hopefully from from us, but uh, I think we're gonna have to step step it up quite a lot to yeah to be to be con- competitive. So when you say uh, the track is faster, what kind of things that does that mean? Does it mean the banks are are steeper or? No, uh, it's uh, some of it, it's it's the shape of the track. So if it has a uh, longer like turns, uh, if it's uh, more round. All, all around, uh, it, it's a bit faster. Uh, then obviously the the weather is a huge, huge impact uh, on fast times, uh, and the the conditions were really good in in Berlin. That's also a reason for for the fast times, and uh, also the track in Tokyo is uh, a bit in altitude. I think it's like three or four hundred meters uh, altitude, and that also uh, is an advantage uh, in the, in our density and. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not an expert in, in, in that uh, stuff, but uh, it, it it should be a pretty fast track. So the helmets were something that kind of grabbed headlines. How big of a difference they look like? I don't know. They look like uh, something funny, but uh, they they must be designed completely for aerodynamic um, pinnacle. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the first time you saw, uh, we saw it was uh, in the Olympic time trial in uh, in London, where Gustav Larsson uh, wore it for the first time. So the helmet is actually designed around him, I think. But uh, I guess just because of uh, it is being so, yeah, kind of ugly, uh, no one really wanted to buy it. Uh, so they stopped uh, producing it again, uh, a puck. Uh, but um, yeah, if you... Um, I think it it can be a a pretty good helmet if you if you know how to use it probably. Uh, but uh, with that said, uh, it's definitely not the fastest helmet fastest helmet out there. Um, and there are improvements uh, to be made on that point as well. Uh, but uh, aerodynamics in, in in general is is pretty hard to just say that is quick and that is not quick because it it depends so much on the person and and the shape of the person and how they are sitting on the bike. So, yeah, yeah, I can't really say exactly how good it actually is. So you have also started riding on the road. Started riding with Giant Castelli, which seems like the more I talk about this team, the more incredible the riders that were on that team and how outrageous that that team didn't continue. Uh, what was it like to be part of that? It was a good uh, way to start my senior career uh, because of a lot of my uh, colleagues from the track were were also there uh, in Casper Pedersen, Casper Falzak and Rasmus uh, Craig. So yeah, it was just a really nice place uh, and really familiar. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, they had to fold at the end of the season um, because of uh, yeah money problems. Um, but luckily, uh, I have uh, gotten on uh, from there pretty good. So in late 2017, you had a injury which kind of left you out of the 2018 season as well. It was a serious knee injury. Yeah, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit weird, uh, to be honest, because uh, I had uh, three operations: uh, uh, two on my right knee and one on my left knee, uh, and uh, no one really knew except exactly what was wrong. So um, yeah, I got back during the winter of 2017-2018 and was able to train a bit and did the Worlds in, in Abeldorm. Uh, but after that, uh, I was, yeah, I couldn't ride my bike nearly for, for nine months or yeah, nearly 10 months, actually. Yeah, suddenly uh, everything just changed and uh, I could ride my bike again. It, it was really weird, weird and uh, I don't exactly know what happened, uh, to, be, to be honest. So yeah, I started training again uh, 
mid February uh, last year. You, you were writing for Colo Crick. What was that transition from Giant Castelli to Colo Crick? Was it kind of the same because it's a Danish continental team? Uh, yeah, um, they had they had a bit bigger setup, uh, but uh, again, it's the continental team in Denmark. Uh, uh, yeah, it's quite similar uh, for every team. Um, but, but again, uh, it was some great people who is and was on that team. Um, so they really helped me uh, during my hard time with, with my knee problems. Um, and uh, yeah, luckily they were able to send me off to Uno X uh, this year. So um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, what they have done for me. Yeah, last year you actually had this amazing hat trick that you did where you won Skiuluvel. Uh, the under-23 Frankfurt race, and the last one was, oh, under-23 uh, Danish Championship. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, were you just flying, or were you... Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I think when I won, uh, yeah, when I won Frankfurt, uh, I've been back training for two and a half months, or, or two months or so. So, uh, yeah, my shape wasn't, that good actually but uh i don't know uh i just i just think i in some way evolved evolved uh, a bit during my uh uh yeah injury period um so it wasn't so hard for me to get back to a, a competitive level again um but yeah uh it, but again it, it it's not the biggest races uh and the uh, frankfurt is a is a under 23 race and uh yeah, so the level obviously wasn't that high when you think about it. Uh, but yeah, it was a great uh, motivation boost for me to see that uh, I could come back to a pretty decent level, uh, not uh, yeah, without so much training. You also went to the Post Denmark Tour of Denmark. What was it like doing that for the first time? Oh, it was so fun, uh, especially because uh, Niklas, uh, he ended up uh, winning it. So that was a great experience, and uh, especially riding uh, around in Copenhagen uh, in the last stage with uh, so many people. And we rode uh, yeah, uh, past my uh, my home, actually. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's just a, a really fun uh, race, and uh, uh, it sucks that uh, it's not coming back this year. Uh, but, yeah, hopefully I can ride it again in the future. Yeah, I don't quite understand why they didn't, they cancelled it this year. Yeah, I, I I don't know either. I think it's someone something with the, the sponsors, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Then what you alluded to before, you've uh, joined Uno X, this like really exciting Norwegian continental pro continental team, and they seem like they're supporting because Julius is there with you as well, and is Niklas there as well? Yeah. Uh, so they're really supporting you with your track development, and then presumably you're gonna ride on the road for them. Yeah, it is a pro continental team on, on the road. So uh, obviously their main focus is, is the road, but uh, their philosophy is also that they want to develop each rider as much as, as they can uh, and uh, in their own pace, uh, so, to, so to say. So uh, they give us uh, the freedom uh, we need so we can uh, focus on the track for the Olympics and uh, support us in every way they can uh, with races and, uh, and stuff in between. So it fits our program. And obviously we want to... We want to do uh, well for them uh, on the road uh, because uh, all of us have ambitions on the road after uh, Tokyo as well. But yeah, it's a great project and uh, I'm really happy to be a part of it. So them being continental, uh, pro-continental team and the tour starting next year in Denmark, is there any way that they could sneak a wild card and or does it clash with the Olympics for you guys? Uh, yeah, firstly, it clashes with the Olympics okay. uh, for us. But uh, at the same time, uh, since they are not a, a French team, uh, it's pretty hard to get a, a wild card for the tour anyway. And uh, also, if you want to have a wild card, you have to be like, I guess, the one uh, yeah, one of the two best pro continental teams in the world. And uh, yeah, um, I don't think we are going to be uh, that good this year. Uh, we have a lot of young riders. It's not the, the ambition of the team uh, either. So. Um, yeah, they are taking things slow and uh, want to make sure that the riders uh, develop uh, in a in a good pace. Well, you should have like a properly good calendar uh, when you start on the road with them. All the Norwegian races 
for Denmark, obviously. Like, there should be so many of these really competitive uh, week-long stage races that you can get your teeth into. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to have a really, uh, yeah, really packed program uh, like the rest of the world. But, uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to starting racing again, uh, actually. It's been so long now, uh, and uh, every, everyone is just, uh, like, sort of stamping in the ground to get going. Um, so it's going to be packed and it's going to be uh, tough, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting started. Are you guys going to race on the road then for this revised calendar? Yeah, we are full uh, road racing uh, this year uh, since uh, we don't have a, or we don't have so many track uh, obligations uh, during the summer. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously it's going to take uh, some uh, some time away uh, from the team uh, next year so we can uh, yeah, prepare uh, the way we we want to uh, up, up to the Olympics. You know what race is that the, well, you got? Because uh, I've only really seen the World Tour calendar. Uh, no, uh, I actually don't. Yeah, I think I'm going to get the, the program soon. But again, uh, in some ways, it, it's not really concerning me that much because I don't think it's going to get through anyway. The tour is gonna, probably going to go through uh, because it's the tour. But uh, yeah, I don't think... Uh, the program then that the UCI have sent out is going to be anything near what's going to happen. Uh, it's just not realistic, I think, to put like people from 20 or 30 different countries together in one race all around the world in like two months. It just seems, yeah, uh, it just doesn't seem uh, possible, to be honest. Yeah, you're right. So, uh, and going back to your track, in a normal time, what would your week look like as a elite uh, track rider from day to day yeah i guess it depends a lot of uh, when uh, we are in in the year uh, so actually most of what we do is road uh, we are more or less uh, road racers uh, all around the uh, yeah year round uh, and then we have some time where we do uh, specific training camps um to get some of the intervals and uh, yeah base miles in the, in the way that we wanted to kind of get in uh, but um, yeah, we don't ride that much on the track, to be honest. We have some preparations or some small training camps uh, year year round, but uh, it's not so much. Uh, we have some uh, obligations uh, uh, to our world teams, so that's in some ways our main focus because the Danish Federation uh, can really support us the way that the, the Australian or the British Federation can, where they can just pay that full salary uh, and then they can do it exactly what they want them to do so um yeah we have to uh, ride on the road teams as well and uh, have to do stuff for them as well um which we are happy to do obviously because we want to be good uh, on the road uh, uh, at the same time um and it seems like we have found the, the perfect way to balance it out so we can do both it must make the transition a lot easier once you finish on the track yeah it, it does um of, yeah, of course, uh, there is a, a small t- transition time, but uh, uh, after a couple of weeks, you are sort of back to the, yeah, back to, uh, yeah, I don't know what to call it. Uh, you're just back uh, road racing again uh, with the guys from your team. So uh, it's nice that it's not uh, yeah, so long away from each other. All right, final question. When you were growing up, who was your hero? Or inspiration? Honestly, uh, I don't really have uh, one hero or one uh, inspiration, uh, maybe except except for my father. Um, he's a guy I, I look up to really much, uh, the way he handles things. But uh, other than that, uh, I would say that there's one specific uh, cycling star or person that has influenced, influenced me like so much all right thank you for that frederick we'll look out for you in well this revised calendar and of course the olympics where hopefully fingers crossed you guys take gold so right. thanks thank for you. That. and all your social media will be left down in the description down below thank you that's it for this lockdown interview with Frederick Rohnberg. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe to not miss out on any upcoming videos. Or if you would prefer, we also have the podcast, so we've included that in the description down below. Why not check out the interview with one of Frederick's teammates in the form of Julius Johansson or Team Sunweb's Kasper Petersen. Thank you for watching and see you next time.